I am Vinny Totterich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there before long. You will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like our guest today. Uh, she's been with us before, and she is back in again today. I love having this woman on. She's a keto nutritionist. That's right. A keto nutrition. She's a nutritionist that believes in keeping it low carb. I'm talking about my friend, Miss Amy Berger. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, what you want to do, Amy, that, that song, that song was on my mind. Well, number one, because your name is actually Amy. But more so, it's because of the email conversation we just had earlier. And you know, it, it really is Amy, what you want to do that, that that's where we are now, right? I mean, in that, isn't that where we are in this world? I love that song. I'm so tickled that you started with that song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, uh, sometimes I'll play songs like I'll have a woman on named Melissa and I, I'll play Melissa and it's like, don't you love that song? You know, sweet Melissa. And they're going, I've never heard it before in my life. And it's like, then I realize that I'm ancient, right? It's like, well, shit, I'm 61. The woman I'm talking to is 42. And she has no idea about the song, Melissa. Yeah, because those those both are classic songs. So I think it just depends on who you're talking to. Yeah, I'm always looking for someone named Judy to come on the podcast so I could do Sweet Judy, Judy Blue Eyes. Um, you know, so I'm always <laughs> looking for people with names that can match songs. But Amy, th there's a reason why I wanted to talk to you and you actually, you know, all right, I'm going to tell the I'm going to let the audience in on my little secret. I really have a tough time booking the Friday show. And the reason being is, is because I try to find guests with just incredible knowledge, right? That's why you hear Ben Bigman, why you hear um, you know, Nadir Ali, Ali and, and Georgia Ede and Nina Tyshows and Gary Tobbs, you hear these names and then you'll go, wait a minute. Uh, and Zoe Harcomb, I could go down. It, it's a rogues list of, of really knowledgeable people. And Amy falls into that category. And then you'll go, wait, didn't you just have them on a year ago? And didn't you just have them on a year before that? The answer is yes. Because for one, their message never gets old. Number two, they're always doing research and they have new stuff to talk about. And number three, they're not trying to sell you a program. Now, Amy's a writer. She's written books. Amy, what's your, I, I can't, I should have it written down. What's your book called? Uh, well, my most recent book was End Your Carb Confusion that I wrote with Eric Westman. But um, my first book that kind of got me known in the low carb world was The Alzheimer's Antidote. And then I wrote The Stall Slayer, which is just a little skinny self-published book about breaking fat loss stalls on low carb and keto diets. Which I want to talk about today. We're going to get into that a little bit today. And I know you're working on another book. Don't push it yet because people are going to write to me and go, what was the name of that book? It's like, no, 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 she's working on it. You can't get yeah, it. Yeah, it's not out yet. We don't, it doesn't even have a title yet. <laughs> right. And, you know, when I was talking about the rogues gallery of people, you know, Eric Westman's another one that, that comes to mind that you want to bring these people on, um, Dr. Lustig and, and the whole group. But then there are a lot of people and people say, hey, why don't you have this person? Or why don't you have that person? I'll go look them up. And they're selling programs and they're conning people into buying these programs from what people like myself and Amy and uh, the aforementioned group of people will literally give away for free or for very inexpensively. Like you, yeah, you might have to buy a book, but it's not like you got to buy a program and be in the program for six months and pay into the program and the whole thing. And like, I know what you're going to say. Well, Vinny, you got your, your accountability group, but think about what that is. It's an accountability group, right? It's just there so that people can be accountable and just stay the course, right? And talk about when stalls happen. And when, you know, last week we did a whole thing in the accountability group where we talked about uh, success stories because I wanted people who are not having success not to feel discouraged, right? So we're always doing rah-rah sessions and this is how it works and the whole thing. And we do it at a very low price and people can bow out whenever they want. There's, it's not hard. You, know, you quit tomorrow. 
I won't know. It'll, you'll just go away, right? That's fine. That's your prerogative. There's no, you have to buy in and do this whole thing. And Amy, you're the same way, you know, and you were like saying, I don't even know what we're doing anymore. And I got to tell you, Nina Teichos and I've had that same conversation. You know, it's like, are we doing anything? Are we getting anywhere? What say you? I, um, <clears throat> I have to sometimes just remind myself that keto really is potentially anyway, for some people life changing, right? You can lose a hundred pounds, which could ch change your life. Be completely free of type two diabetes. Stop taking insulin for type two reverse your PCOS and conceive a child, you know, look at, um, Matt Bazuki, like, like incredible improvements in things like bipolar and schizophrenia. I mean, this is a radically powerful way to eat. And I have to remember that there's people out there that need that message because unfortunately, like you and I were talking about earlier, I'm starting to get very discouraged and disillusioned by all the snake oil salesmen and the, and the hyperbole and the clickbait that is turning people off from this. And it's, it's pushing people away. And the, the people who are the most hyperbolic and the, the people who do the most fear mongering, this, this will kill your metabolism. This thing is poison. Those people are the most popular. And it's, it's just discouraging in the age of social media that that's how it's become when you know you and i you could go to the supermarket you see a hundred people whose lives you could probably change in 60 days right. and it's it just starts to it starts to wear on you you know because you, you and i have been in this a long time i've been eating low carb myself since before facebook even existed before youtube existed before mm -hmm. reddit existed and it's such a blessing but it's also a curse right look how many people we are able to reach and and but then look how look how bastardized this becomes and how the the message the signal gets lost among the noise i'll say it that way yeah but it, yeah I, i'm gonna yeah but you i'm not gonna yes and you because you're correct the message gets muddled especially when you know meta which is facebook and, and uh, instagram will start to block someone like I'll give you an example, I quit doing Instagram about, I don't know, two months ago, I just said, screw this, because they they were they were not even showing it. And they were taking people away from me. Like people would write to me, go, why did you take me off of your it's like, I never take anyone off. Mm -hmm. right? I had gone from like 100,000, I'm, I'm, I'm down to like 93,000. I mean, they just kept taking people away. And when I would look at my dashboard, it was always okay, we showed this to 10,000 people, but it was 10,000 of your 100,000 people. So we showed it to 10% of your people. And it would show a number and I'm not kidding, like 42 outside of your people, which means mm -hmm. if you weren't even in my group, they weren't, even, they, they weren't letting you get out, right? The, the, it happened again the other day, I finally, you know, uh, Susan, there's this woman, Susie Demeester, uh, did a thing where she lost all this weight and her before and after picture was just amazing. And I love celebrating these people. I went, oh, God, I got to put this everywhere. So I had Debbie also put it on Instagram. And I looked at Instagram a day later, and sure enough, they showed it to like 12,000 of my followers and exactly 59 outside of anyone who 59. Right? 12,000 people saw it, but only 59. You know, that's just, that's crazy. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it, 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 and it makes you wonder, it's like, okay, they're against you, obviously, they're against you. And, you, and you have all these other people making noise and doing clickbait, and no one is stopping them. They're not getting shadow banned. Yeah. Right. And you look at that and go, okay, why, why am I doing any of this? Right? But then, and this is where the yeah, but comes in one person will write to me and go, you know, I, I couldn't get pregnant. Here's a picture of my, my newborn. Right? You just mentioned that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, this guy in England, uh, I'll say his name because he's all Andy, Andy Reynolds and his wife, were, they were at wits end. Kid was having seizures day and night. Right? Hey, man, heard you 
on Corolla eight years ago, tried this crap. The kid has got a normal life, wow. you know, and that's why you keep doing it. Not because, you know, someone over in uh, Silicon Valley thinks you're a dickhead. You do it because a guy from England says my kid is normal. And a woman in Mississippi says, I have a kid. By the way, I asked that woman in Mississippi, did you name your kid Vinny? And she said it was a girl. And I said, you could still name it Vinny. Or Vin right. Vincenza, you know? Yeah, my, my great grandmother's name was Vincenza, but you name a girl V I N I Vinny, she's going to grow up to be a beautiful woman. You, there's no ugly Vinny females. Come on. Probably but no, I, I think I think you're exactly right. It's just this, and it's this is like my own personal mind battle to get over is that I sometimes get so discouraged and so disheartened by what I see on social media, by the ugliness, by the, you know, sensationalist people getting all the attention. I, I really have to just remember why we do this because it, it really does matter. But it, but that's human nature, right? You get, you know, well, this, this is kind of a bad example here, but, you know, let's say 50 emails or 50 comments say, this is so great. This is so important. I love it. But what do we remember? The one I can swear on this podcast, right? Sure. The one, the one asshole who says, "Oh, you're stupid. You're blah blah blah." That's the thing that sticks with us. So it's, it's, I guess, the reverse. I, I need to remember that there is a lot of distasteful stuff going on and a lot of um, just unfortunate stuff going on. But that doesn't have to take away from the things that you and I do and, and all, all the other people you mentioned earlier who. You know, we might not ever meet them in person. They might watch a, a podcast from or, you know, listen to a podcast from five or eight years ago or watch a video from eight years ago and change their life just from that. Look, I mean, Ken Berry, how, how many people have gone to their doctor, their endocrinologist for 10, 15, 20, 30 years? They're, they never get better diabetes. They get more and more drugs, more and more drugs. They watch one Ken Berry video and they lose 50 pounds and reverse their diabetes. Right. So we that's what I have to remember. Like, that is what matters here. Yeah, well, wow, you go deeper than me, because I'm never triggered or upset by because people are calling me a murderer, a climate denier, which that that one I will never understand is like, I deny that we have a climate. I, I don't even know what that means. I know what they mean to say that somehow I'm wrecking the climate we have by allowing people I'm not allowing people to eat meat. So I don't know how I'm involved with the client. And I don't know why meat has become the problem with the ozone layer, because I've had experts like Frank Meat Learner and uh, I love Fred, him, yeah. and all these guys who and, and uh, agronomists like uh, 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 what's his name? Peter uh, Ballerstadt, I think. Peter is, Ballerstadt and all those guys. He's great. You know, who are saying no. And these are experts. Right? And they're going, uh, not even close, not even in the ballpark. Uh, as a matter of fact, cattle are good for the earth, is good for the environment. You know, we need ruminants as part of the ecosystem. Yet we have governments, right? So you see, I don't worry about the people on the internet calling me an asshole. Call me whatever you want. Yeah. But when you have your government saying that this is bad and it's not based on anything, and and of course, these are the people that are always saying, follow the science. Okay, well, follow. And okay, government, follow some science. I, I'd yeah. be more than happy if you actually looked at science before you unleash the mayor of New York City who wants to do meatless Mondays. Yeah. Or, you know, hair gel out in California who tells people meat is bad. Or, you know, I don't get where these people are coming from. Why? Just because some group of people that's going to vote for you thinks that is a good idea to get rid of cattle? You're going to go with that? Is that what you're doing? Because I thought that elected, you know, officials were supposed to be there to do the will of the people, not just the will of a couple of people who are loud, right? It's not supposed to work that way, but that's where we are. What say you? Uh, wow. It's, it's hard to say anything about that. It's not my area of expertise, but I, I mean, actually I have worked at local farms. I've worked at probably three or four small farms in, uh, Virginia, Maryland, Washington, DC, North Carolina. And 
anyone who thinks cows are responsible for anything bad in the environment simply has never spent much time around a cow. It just, even even chickens like they you know how they have the mobile chicken coops where the right. chickens you know they run around in the grass they eat they peck they peck around for grubs and worms and they poop and they leave all their chicken poop and then they get moved every couple of days to a new patch of grass well all that poop is the world's best fertilizer and so you could put these chickens on a desolate dry brush scrubby piece of land leave them there pooping and eating for a few days and then move them on. And a few weeks later, this beautiful grass is growing there. I've seen this at every farm and it just, again, I, I am not a climate expert. I'm not a, you know, an environmental expert, but I've seen up close and personal what animals do to grass and they always tend to leave it better than they found it. You know, it just, I mean, this is madness. It's, it, it, you could not get it more backward if you tried that you know red meat is bad for health red meat is bad for the environment red meat is bad for that it's almost the exact opposite right well, now there's said, a way if you if you're talking about the manure lagoons and these factory feeding systems is that great no nobody's arguing that but that's not the cow's fault that's the fault of the system that we humans have engineered to make right. this stuff cheaper and faster so it's not still not the cow's fault, <laughs> not the pig's fault, you know? Right. And, and we, you know, if we worked on that, if we got together with the vegans and said, Hey, let's work on this together, but they're not interested in that. Right. They're interested in people eating fake food, which has now created a whole fake. I don't know if you saw my last documentary beyond impossible, but you know, I hit that head on where we just talk about the fake food industry. Yeah. It's a problem. I mean, when you look, problem. yeah, when you look at the inputs that it takes to create that lab grown meat or even the, the burgers and stuff, the fake meat that is actually just vegetables, like black beans and onions and stuff like that, even that compared to, have you ever had Rob Wolf on this show? No, he's never been. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, we've asked him and he doesn't want to come on. Okay. Well, you know who he is. So yeah, love him or hate him. Yeah. He, I think he's doing a great job. Yeah. He he once said a while back, you know, when it like like properly raised beef, it's cow, cow plus sunlight plus rain plus grass. That's right. it. That's what it takes. Now, okay, granted, it has to go to the slaughterhouse and processing whatever, but that's nothing compared to engineering this cellular sludge that has to be made into something you can eat. I just it's everything is so backward. I, I actually recently started coaching for a new program. I don't know if you know Dr. Mariella Glant. She's, she spends time between Israel and Spain and the US, but she's sort of well known in the keto world. And I'm doing some coaching there. And she, um, sorry, no, we, we have new people. And in my private practice, most of the people who come to me are already doing a low carb or keto diet and they just need help. They, they're not getting the results they want. But all of these people through this coaching platform are brand new. They've never heard of keto, never, they don't know what's going on. And it's so interesting because unlike the people who normally come to me, all of these people are still steeped in that conventional wisdom. Oh, well, I'm eating brown rice, that's better, right? Or, oh, well, these crackers are gluten-free, that's good, right? And these are people, I mean, all of them are either diabetic or they have obesity, they have fatty liver, they've got all these things. They really need a much, much lower carb diet and it's so hard for them to wrap their heads around. Like it's, you know, I, how many how many of them have asked me, is it, it's, I had I had two eggs for breakfast. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah, it, it's just so different from what the average person. So you and I live in the bubble, right? This is second nature to us, but we're still such a tiny piece of the overall population that has no clue about any of this. Look, I've talked about this before on the show, but when I was a kid, I'm 61 years old now, so I was growing up in the 70s. And there were there were some definites. And I grew up on a bayou in Louisiana. I did not grow up in some metropolitan area. Yeah, we had television with three channels and we were able to see whatever ABC, CBS or NBC played, right? But there were truths, right? 
when you played football, everyone would say, you need to eat more meat. You got to get that meat in, you put muscle on, you're playing football, right? Uh, I was lifting weights as a young guy. You know, eat meat, eat eggs, eat a lot of fish. You got to get a lot of protein. You want to, you know, you want to build, we break down your muscles, you got to build up, you need protein. I understood that as when I was 10 years old, because I was lifting weights very young. I understood because older people who were not doctors, scientists, not Jim, you know, my favorite guy was a gym rat a guy named Joe Bonadonna. Eat protein, you're going to put on you, you need to you need to feed your muscles, you broke down the muscle, you need to feed them, right? That made sense to me. It got even worse, because my grandmother and my great grandmother, who was from Italy, I think between them, they didn't have five years of education because they, they grew up dirt poor and the whole thing, and they never got to go to school or anything. So you're talking about an old Italian woman with the babushka and barely spoke English, you know, my great grandmother, and they would tell you, you know, there was not too much bread, not too much pasta. It's going to make you, you know, panza. You're going to get a panza. You're going to get fat. You're going to get fat. Panza, panza, panza. They knew to keep bread away from it's like, don't eat bread, you're gonna get fat. Oh, that's too much bread, right? Uh, don't drink, co they knew things like, oh, Coca Cola, no, don't, don't drink the Coca Cola. That's why I grew up without any soft drinks. Why, what's that gonna do to me? It's gonna give you diabetes. They knew this. They, these are terms I heard as a kid. How did these people who grew up with nothing, with hardly any education, one of them barely speaking English, the other is an old Italian woman living on the bayou. They knew this stuff. So I grew up knowing this stuff. People who are telling me eat protein to get muscle and other people in babushkas telling me don't eat too much bread, you're gonna get fat. Okay, message received, yeah. right? So then the question becomes, when did it change? Well, I know when it changed. And Amy, I think you're a lot younger than me. So I remember in 1980 and 81, when all of a sudden, everyone was like, you can't eat, you can't eat meat, meat's gonna make you fat. I was sitting there going, wait a minute, it's <laughs> not what I heard my entire life. Now I'm 20 and meat's gonna make me fat. It, yeah. You know, and then I, you got to eat more pasta. Why? Why is that? <clears throat> Why, why? You remember why they told us to eat pasta, Amy? Do you remember the deal? Well, it's low in fat. It's, it's the bottom of the food pyramid. Right. But they, they would say, if you don't eat fat, you can't get fat. Right. You are what you eat. That was the first time I heard that. You are what you eat. And if you don't eat fat, you can't get fat. So pasta, rice, corn, eat all you want. It's free food, you can eat all you want. And I'm sitting there going, what about my great grandmother who talked about hollow calories, and getting fat? And, and by the way, by the way, she was correct. Right? Well, and I wouldn't it be nice if there were free foods. But I, it's interesting, this like, it reminds me of when I was in graduate school for nutrition. I, I changed careers. I was not, you know, I wasn't born being a low carb nutritionist. So I was already eating a low carb diet myself for a few years before I went to nutrition school because I, I said, oh, this, I'm so fascinated by this. It's helped me so much. Maybe I could make a career of this and help other people. And so when I would learn the biochemistry, when I would learn beta oxidation or, or ketogenesis and all of these different and learn about what insulin does to me, it just validated what I already knew, like, but I would finally understand why low carb or ketogenic diets work the way they do. So, oh, that's why insulin does that. Oh, that's why this process happens this way. And it, so it just, it confirmed even more for me that this was scientifically sound and, and really helpful and, and working in tune with the human body. And so it's, it's one thing for, the average person out there, even for someone in the government, because the government is just people, it's one thing for them to get it wrong and for them to parrot sound bites that sound like they should be correct, even if they're not. 
Right. But I, I'm more bothered by all the doctors. And, and when I say doctor, I mean doctor, nurse practitioner, PA, any medical professional like that. I, when the medical professionals get it wrong, especially the endocrinologists, the endos are the worst. Now, I'm sure there are some exceptions out there. I'm painting a broad brush, but they tend to be the most scared of keto. Diets. You have to have carbohydrate. Da, da, da. And it's like, that's the problem. When, when medical professionals are actively warning people away from this, you know, and if, if you're some government lackey that you have zero education in biochemistry and physiology, we could almost give you a free pass. You're not expected to know this, but then if you don't know it, you shouldn't be making policy for people. So it, it just bothers me more when the medical, medical, and I would say nutrition and dietetics professionals get it wrong. Yeah, you're right about the endocrinologist. And, you know, it's a funny thing. And I look at myself as an in one experiment, right? Uh, I show up at the gym. And um, there's a bunch of old people when I go to the gym. When I say old, they're my age, I'm 61. They're all, they're all between, you know, 60 and 70, 75, men and women. Um, because we go midday. Right? And sounds braggadocious, but here goes it, you know, I'll get I, I've had I've been pulled aside by several people. Hey, how much HRT are you on? It's like, zero. Oh, come on, you can tell me how much are you, you're taking some HRT, right? HRT is uh, is a uh, hormone replacement therapy, folks, meaning steroids. And it's like, No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not. It's like, yeah, but you, you have a lot of lean muscle mass. Yeah, you know, I'm not and it's like you're never in here you 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 know one guy told me <laughs> this doesn't happen every time guy goes you come in after me and leave before me yeah because I'm doing it right I walk in I stimulate the muscle the brain muscle you know that that stimulation happens everything knows what to do now and I go home and I eat some protein mainly animal protein well only animal protein okay so how are you keeping yourself so lean at 61? No carbs, some carbs, no carbs. It's average carbs? No, no. The only carbs my body will ever see is from dairy product, usually cheese, right? <laughs> That's the only carbs my body sees. Whatever's in heavy whipping cream is what my body sees in carbs. So I'm the prime example of what you can do by cutting out that macronutrient to where people think you're taking a drug to look that way. Right? Now, in in their defense, I live this life 24 seven, just like you do. Right? 24 seven, I'm always I, I never eat junk. You know, when I say never hardly ever. Right? I mean, that's what it takes. I'm living the life. I'm working out every day. I don't take breaks from working out. I don't take a month off or two months or forget about it and come back to it. It's just like I said, always It's like wiping your ass and brushing your teeth. Those are two habits. We don't have to do them. I've been to countries where where toilet paper is an option. Right? So That's not true. everybody in the world wipes their ass, not everybody in the world brushes their teeth. Those are good habits that we do every day. Why do you think we have good hygiene and especially good oral hygiene? Because we wipe up and we brush up, right? That's why. That's what puts us ahead of some third world countries, right? But well, we don't have flies roaming around us all the time. I'm just well, stating a fact here. Right? I heard, I heard Andreas Ehrenfeld, you know, the diet doctor, and he's got some new venture <laughs> now, but he he said something about you know, all, to all the people that say low carb isn't sustainable, because you know, the minute the minute you stop, then the weight comes back or the health problems come back. And he said, Yeah, it's it's just like showering, you have to do it regularly for it to work. <laughs> like, you go, Oh, oh I, I showered six months ago, therefore, I'm done, I don't need to do it anymore. Right? No, you have to keep doing it if you want to keep getting the benefit. So yeah, if you want to have good hygiene, you keep showering, right? Yeah, you can't you can't have good hygiene for one day and expect it to just last the whole rest of your life. Yeah. And you could do the same thing with brushing your teeth. You could say, well, look, I've, I've brushed them all the way up. You know, I brushed them from the time I was a kid. And uh, here I am. Uh, I'm, I'm 58 years old. I stopped brushing them last year. 
what happened this year? I got a ton of calories. My teeth are, you know, this and that and the whole thing I have. My gum disease has come on and everything else. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how that happened. I did it correctly for 58 years. I just took this last year off. Mm-hmm. Well, there you have it. Right. right? It, it, you can't take time off. And I know that and people go, well, geez, I don't want to, I don't want to be part of that program. Okay. Well, you don't want to be healthy. I, I will say though, I'll, I'll do, I'll do my yeah, but here, I, I think that the keto community, and I include myself in this, we as a whole are doing a little bit of a disservice because not everybody needs an ultra strict ketogenic diet. And I, there are a lot of people out there who actually can't, not only can they have carbs, they actually do a little bit better with them. Now, before the zealots come burn me at the stake, no carbohydrate is not required in the diet. Yes, you can live without it. You can also live without saturated fat. You can live without cholesterol. There's a lot of things your body will make if you don't ingest any. That doesn't mean that some people might not feel better if they do ingest some. So I, I've had some clients along the way that I actually did recommend increasing carbs, not to 200 grams a day or something, and I'm not telling them to eat Pop-Tarts and Frosted Flakes, but just depending on the individual situation. So I think, again, the hyperbole coming out of the keto community, making people think that you know, a piece of cantaloupe is gonna bring in, put you in a coffin, like this is madness. Now, but I can say that, while also absolutely acknowledging that for some people, they do absolutely need an ultra strict ketogenic diet and you can consider it like a medical therapy. It's, they're, just not, they're not eating that way for fun. If they don't eat that way, they'll have a seizure or they will have a manic episode or so, you know something crazy will happen. So, but the carbs, you know, sometimes we go, we, we just go a little too far. I mean, you probably see this all the time. People are terrified of food. They're yeah. ter- right. You, we, you can't have broccoli because of goitrogens and you can't have spinach because of oxalates and you can't have this because of the phytic acid. Well, eventually you're just going to breathe air and starve to death. Right. You know, right. and by the way, I have all of those things you just said. And, you know, I'm always asked, you know, it's like, well, you look, you, you're lean and mean. You should have carbs sometimes. The only reason I stay as strict as I do is because I've been using myself as an experiment against cancer. And I have Thomas Seyfried coming back on the show to talk about this kind of thing. They told me when um, I got cured from leukemia that my form meant that there was still leukemia in my bone marrow and that within five years it was going to come back. And, And the story goes, they told me that in 2007, it was 2024, it's never come back. Yeah. Right. So 17 years. So that's why I'm so strict. And people go, wow, you, you live such a stoic life and you're so strict. And by the way, I still have broccoli. I still have, you know, cauliflower. I still have vegetables. And I was lamenting the other day because once or twice a year, I'll have ice cream. And I haven't had ice cream now for like a year. And the other day, I was going, you know what? Because I can't bring ice cream in the house. If I bring a pint, I'm going to eat the whole pint. Yeah, forget it. So, I mean, you know what? There was a, a place in town where you could just get a scoop. And you see, I can do a scoop because when I'm done, I'm done. I'll come home and drink a coffee, get it out of my t- And I was like, oh, I'm going to stop and get an ice cream. And then I thought about it. And I went, you know what? My wife, my wife is out in L.A. right now shooting a, a TV series. I said, you know, I'm going to wait until she comes home because she loves ice cream too. And the woman never has ice cream because I never have ice cream. And she lives low carb also, right? She, mm-hmm. But she, she has a lot more carbs in her low carb life than I do, a, a ton more. And I said, you know, she loves ice cream. We never, I, I'm going to wait till she comes home. Then I'll buy a pint. We can split it. Nice. Right. So, you know, you, you make choices along the way. As much as I wanted that right then, fuck, I've gone a year, maybe a year and a half without it. I'm just going to go and get it when she comes home. As a matter of fact, she comes home Sunday. I might have it here when she comes home as mm-hmm. a treat. Who knows? I'm but so I'm interested. You eat it so rarely. I want to know what flavor you go for. But I, <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Yeah, it's, you know, when people say, oh, that's so restrictive or you're so, you live such a a, a small life with the food. 
it's if you enjoy what you eat, it doesn't feel restrictive. Like I don't, I don't miss pasta. I don't, I don't ever make even zucchini noodles or stuff like that. Cause I don't miss pasta. I don't do a lot of cauliflower rice. Cause I don't miss rice. I don't have to. And, and to people that want to recreate those things, that's fine. I, I'm not judging right. against that, but restriction is in the eye of the beholder. You know, if you don't feel, what's what's more restrictive not eating sugar and starch or having chronic pain and limited mobility and brain fog and acne and joint pain and heartburn and and diabetes and you know i mean what's really more restrictive but again if you right. to those of us that love meat we love fish we love eggs it doesn't feel restrict we don't feel deprived i guess is a better word i don't feel deprived because i don't miss those things I'm the same way. Uh, we have things like zucchini noodles from time to time because Serena will make them. And somehow she'll make a cream sauce to go with it. And then there'll be a piece of fish or something on top. So when she does it, and by the way, she knows to put just a small amount on my plate because I'm not going to really eat it, even if she puts it there. Um, and she'll do the cauliflower rice every now and again, just to make something taste like something she wants it to taste like. But like I said, she's been gone for 13 weeks. She's been coming home every four, third after every third week, she comes home for a week. Mm -hmm. I went this time around, I've had and tonight I'm counting tonight is going to be the 10th night in a row I've eaten fish. And you imagine people go fish every night, you're gonna die of mercury report. No, I get my mercury checked. I, you know, I'm fine with you know, my body processes, you know, and I, I buy small fish, I don't get big fish. It's always trout or salmon or something like that. I'm not buying big fish that has way tons of mercury in it. Right. And people, go, why do you eat fish every night? Are you trying to lose weight? No, no. I love fish, yeah. and I know how to make it five different ways. I grew up in Cajun country. I know how to make a piece of fish. I can do lemon butter. I can do, you know, Anna Vocino has two or three recipes or this or that. And they'll go, well, you never get tired of it. It's like apparently not. Right. And and isn't, everybody... it, isn't, isn't it funny how when you kind of eat this way, people think, oh, the bacon and eggs every morning or what, whatever you have. And nobody says to a car beater, another bagel and cream cheese. You had that the last six days or another bowl of cornflakes. Yeah. Nobody. But I, I feel like this is so negative. I want to. I, I, I feel like I unfortunately have become known for ranting because I, I do rant a lot, but I, I mean, I feel like I want people to know how much I really do love keto and how much, how really helpful this way of eating is. I don't want to get so stuck on the negative, but it just is, that's so interesting, isn't it? The people will comment when you're eating the same thing. Like, let's say you have a steak every night for two weeks. Right. People think that's weird, but if again, if you were to have a sandwich every day for lunch, no one thinks that's weird. Your right. oh, your your bologna and cheese sandwich on two pieces of white bread, like oh, that's a totally normal lunch every single day for six months. Well, you know, Amy, you 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 have a point really close to mine where people they'll say, oh yeah, as a kid, every morning I would have the I can only say the ones I remember, like Captain Crunch or you know, Count Chocula or yeah. something like that, you know? Yeah. And I'll say, you had that every day. And it's like, yeah. So you had the equivalent of a piece of chocolate cake every day for, I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah. You had, you literally, it's like, no, that was, you know, they had eight vitamins and iron. Yeah. And I had it with skim milk, right? So that made it healthy. And then I've always said, well, that's a Sophie's choice, right? Which which of the thirteen essential vitamins did they decide to go with? It was all I used to look at that and go eight vitamins. Oh, there are thirteen essential vitamins. Which ones did you decide to leave out? Right. And by yeah. the way, they that that is not in a grain, folks. They have to spray that. They spray it on. It's not even. A, it's a bastardized version of the vitamin. By the time that chemical spray hits the, the thing. It's not even vitamins anymore. You're eating, you're eating paste. It tastes crunchy, but you're eating, you're eating a carbohydrate paste. It's the same as eating a piece of cake. And when you say that to people, they go, come on, it's different. It's, it's got to be healthier. It's fiber in it. On that note, I, oh, hang on, Amy, I got to say this. Uh, speaking of um, 
stuff you're not supposed to eat fruit juice is something you're not supposed to drink. But there is one fruit juice I agree with, I think Amy might agree with it too. And that fruit juice comes from the olive, it's called olive oil. And um, here's the problem in this country, they cut olive oil up to 40%. Amy, did you know that they could cut olive oil up to 40% and still call it? I didn't know it was that much. But I did I know they cut it? Yes, 40%. That's a lot. Yeah, you only have to have 60% real olive oil in the product to call it 100% pure olive oil. You see, it's a play on words, there is 100% pure olive oil in that bottle. But not all of it is 100% pure olive oil, because they have seed oils in there with it. And when you do that, the oil doesn't look the right color. So now they have to add a color to it. So that's more chemical. And it doesn't smell like olive oil. So now they have to add a perfume to it to make it smell like olive oil. In other words, you're getting a bastardized oil, mostly seed oils and bastardized products. That doesn't happen at Villa Capelli. Villa Capelli olive oil is 100% pure olive oil that comes from Puglia. I learned by watching the family Stallone that the Stallone family is from Puglia. Anna Vocino is from Puglia. All the great people are from Puglia. Um, my family is mm, a little ways away called Calabria a poor community. At any rate, you want the good stuff from Puglia. That's where the best trees are grown. Uh, go get Villa Capelli, you want to save 10% put in promo code Vinny V I N N I E for 10% off. If you spend more than $125 after the Vinny discount, you will also get free shipping. So do it all. Go do all the things Villa Capelli V I N N I E no one be why. We're talking to Amy Berger. Amy, mention, brag about some of your books. I, I don't have the names here. Usually I do. And I don't have any of the names in front of me. I, I love you anyway. That's okay. Um, I, <laughs> and I, I will say, listen, everybody, that Villa Capelli olive oil, I am not being paid a dime to say this. I heard about it on Vinny's podcast, I don't know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, whenever it was. And I went to order. I wanted to check some out. And they were out of the small bottle. The only thing they had was, I think, the three liter tin. And I'm yeah. single. I live by myself. I'm not cooking for a family of 12. And I had a friend who had bought some and he said, it's so good. Get the big one. You won't regret it. You'll use it. And I'm like, all right, fine. I got enormous three liter tin of olive oil. And sure enough, it was really delicious and it got used insanely quickly. So anyway. Yeah. Um, that is my non-paid, non-sponsored plug for that olive oil. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll let Stephen uh, Crutchfield know that you did that. And it's, it's true. That is a real story. I got the huge tin. I'm one person. But I mean, listen, I'm like, you know how there, there's old men in Italy that will like do a shot of olive oil in the morning? I don't quite do that, but I'll put some on a spoon and just take it. If you get the really good stuff, it's delicious taking it that yeah. way. I, I'm an old Italian man that does the shot. I don't do it in the morning. I take a lot of fish oil in the morning. I do it around noon or one. Nice. Um, I've always said I'm like a diesel engine. I just run on oil. <laughs> you know, all day. Just oil. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, so my books, my first book was the Alzheimer's antidote, which is um, about using a ketogenic diet for Alzheimer's disease. They call that disease now type three diabetes or diabetes of the brain. And um, there's reason to suspect that a ketogenic diet with or without exogenous ketones will help because the main problem is that the brain is no longer taking up and using glucose for fuel. So the brain is the, the nutshell version, your brain is starving to death. It is starving for energy. And even though the brain is not taking up and using glucose, it will still take up and use ketones. So um, that's that book. My second book was the stall slayer. And again, that's all about breaking those dreaded fat loss stalls on keto, which a lot of people run into. And the most recent book, even though that book is already three years old, is End Your Carb Confusion that I wrote with uh, Dr. Westman. And that one, I think, is really to anyone who's brand new to keto or maybe if you've been doing what you think is keto, you've been cobbling together your own program from 86 different YouTube channels and blogs and stuff. I think, you know, Eric and I wrote that book to be the book that we would want if we were brand new to this and wanted to do it in a really simple, straightforward way, then um, that's, we, we wrote that the way we would want someone to write it to us. Tell me how to do it and why and keep it dead simple. 
And I'm, I'm, my, my fourth book is in progress. It's all my first book that's not about keto at all. It's going to be all about thyroid and that it doesn't have a title yet. It's still in progress, but that's going to be, hopefully that's going to help a ton of people because so many people who come to me who are stuck in fat loss on keto, they're doing keto great. Their, their A1C is nice and low, glucose nice and low, insulin, triglycerides are low, HDL is high, everything looks great and they cannot lose weight. And I see either undiagnosed or improperly treated hypothyroidism all the time. And I can't, I'm not a doctor. I can't prescribe the medicine. I can't change the medicine. So if, if there's any medical professionals out there watching who understand the nuance of thyroid and who will prescribe T3 or who will prescribe natural desiccated thyroid, please contact me because I am desperate to start building a network of people I can refer to. Stepping down um, from the soapbox now. Amy, write this down. You just came up with your title, and I don't think you even caught it when you said it. Okay. And I'm going to give you two. It's one of one of two titles. The first title is All About Thyroid. And the other one, It's All About Thyroid. So write that down. Just mull it over. And well, you, people yeah. have suggested, which I think is funny, because of end your carb confusion, we should have end your thyroid confusion, which I think is pretty cool. But that's not a bad idea. Um, I'm still in love with my idea. But yes, because I came up with it. Um, let's talk a little bit about you mentioned the supplementation and thyroid. Yeah. Which supplements can people take? And are they over the counter? Or do you recommend any supplements? So the ones that I mentioned are actually prescription medication. They are thyroid hormone replacement, basically. Oh. Um, and those you do need a prescription for. Um, you, you will hear various things that there are certain supplements that can help thyroid. I have not seen them be that effective, but like if someone does have, so you need iodine to literally, it's part of the thyroid hormone molecule, contains iodine, it contains the amino acid tyrosine, um, you need selenium to make the conversion of various thyroid hormones. So somebody who's frankly deficient, and I mean, iron is critical for thyroid, someone who's frankly deficient in any of these things might benefit from supplementing. But most of the people that I see, I don't think have those deficiencies. I think it's caused by something else. In women, there's some, some pretty decent evidence that years of yo-yo dieting can mess with thyroid. Oh, so so many middle aged women have low thyroid. I'm shocked. I'm so surprised, right? Like, yeah. so um, and, and there are various, you know, over the counter thyroid support complexes, thyroid support formula. Again, I don't think those are going to hurt anybody. But I don't think they help that much. I think if your body needs the medicine, you need the medicine. And maybe you could get to a point where you can change your diet, your lifestyle, something to get to a point where you no longer need the medicine. But this, if it's really bad, the symptoms are so debilitating. I mean, I, I lived through it myself. It's awful. And I don't want someone to have to be in that hole while they figure things out. I say that medicine can make you feel so much better. Take it. But then while you take it, keep digging, keep trying to get to the bottom of things. Because right. even being on thyroid medicine, like, like one of my personal worst symptom was depression. I, I don't know if it was depression so much as apathy. I didn't care about anything. I didn't, or anhedonia, total lack of pleasure, total lack of joy. And so when you're in that state, good luck wanting to investigate, good luck wanting to get to the bottom of things and make a change. Right. So I think that the medicine can be used as as even a temporary bridge to help somebody get to the point where they want to make different changes. So but the, the thing with thyroid is and we I, I say we because I have a co author, we emphasize this in the book. It's so individual. Some some people can supplement iodine and everything's great and they feel fabulous. A right. lot of people can't like a lot of people need the medicine and there's a few different kinds of thyroid medicine. There's no right and wrong. There's really just what works for the one person. And the some people just need a tiny, tiny low dose. Some people need a dose that will kill an elephant kind of thing. So it's totally individual. But I just I just see this all the time. And I think probably a lot of the keto doctors and nutritionists and stuff do too. 
Um, remind me to ask you a question off the air about thyroid as soon as we the mics go cold. Um, okay. It's about a friend, and I don't want to mention it here. Um, when the you know, I want to talk a little bit about your second book, uh, the stall. When people stall, um, I take I take phone calls every day. I do consults. People can write in, sign up, do a consult, and you know, one of the biggest things you get is, hey, I know this worked because I've lost <clears throat> fill in the blank, 70 pounds, 80 pounds, 100 pounds. But I still have weight to lose. And I seem to have stalled. And I usually see two, three or four different problems, usually when I interview them, and we can pull them out of a stall pretty quickly. What do you see with low carb and stalling? What, what what's the common thing on your side? I want to see if we agree on this. Uh, there's a couple of things. The two easiest to fix, I think, are people simply just eating too much carbohydrate. And it could just be a little bit of that carb creep, or maybe they have, I, and I'm using kind of the wrong phrase, but I'll use it anyway, fallen victim to the keto cereal and the keto cookies and the keto ice cream. And they have no idea how much carbohydrate is actually in that stuff. So right. I think that's one thing. The other thing is overdoing fat. You know, keto is, we definitely love fat. It's delicious, but you can't drown everything in butter and cheese and put, you know, oil in your coffee and expect to lose excess body fat. Now, some people need ultra high fat for medical reasons and stuff, but if you're really stuck in fat loss, then you don't need to go out of the way to add tons and tons of extra fat. Um, other than that, I, I definitely thyroid is a huge issue, but sometimes I think that, and this, you, you probably see this a lot and this, this may hurt some people out there to hear, but I think this is just a reality when pe people have a, a hard time genuinely acknowledging what's going on. Yeah. They eat keto for 98% of the day and then eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night. It's the cookies and the brownies and the ice cream and the chips and the pasta and the whatever. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very human nature thing to do. But if somebody's not going to be honest with us and tell us that there's still some addictive aspect, there's still that stuff creeping in, I'm taking them at their word thinking this is all they're eating for the day, but they're leaving out that whole portion. So that's, that's part of it too. And there's other, th you know, there's medications that make it harder to gain weight and stuff, but I think that that stuff is less common than just simply eating more than our bodies need. I hate, I hate that that's the truth, but I think that that's the truth well, a lot I, of the time. I, so you, you're hearing the same things. You're getting the same things I'm getting. Um, usually with my group, since they're keyed into me, always yelling about the keto products, I do hear that from time to time, but not as often because while we're on the phone, I'll have them go in their pantry and, I would have them read the ingredient list and then they go, Oh, you know, the light bulb comes on. Yeah. I think they already knew what the problem was. They just wanted to get away with something. Uh, the other thing I get a lot. Yeah. I find the biggest problem is the overeating of fat. You know, yeah. as I I've been saying on this podcast from day one, there's nothing we could do with impunity and they get into mm -hmm. that, you know, where they're, Oh, you know, I was losing weight eating all, all I wanted before. So I can just keep doing that. And, that I think that's the biggest problem. Every now and again, the cookie thing, the late night snacking. And the way I figure that out is I'll have them take me through their day. And if I don't hear anything that sneaks that that that, that you know, sticks out, I'll have them go through it again, I'll talk to them for a few minutes and have them go through their day again. And or I'll ask them when they had a recent blood test. And if I hear, you know, blood, glucose numbers that are really high and this and that. I was like, okay, there's something in there. I, I always tell the story and this guy knows who he is. He lives up in, in wine Valley and wine country in, in California. And he's a whiny and you know, he works in an industry and he eats the perfect NSNG, the perfect low carb diet. But he, he was drinking a bottle of wine a day and his blood sugar numbers were off the charts. And it was like, every time he went through his diet, I was like, no, no, no. There's got to be something. Your blood sugar cannot be that number. And you and he's like, no, I'm telling you. And then he finally fessed up and he goes, I have some wine every day. And I said, well, how much? And he goes, 
well, during the week, about a bottle. I said, a bottle a week? He goes, no, a bottle a day. Yeah. And I said, what about the weekends? He goes, I can creep up to two bottles. You know, but he's in that business and he's always tasting and drinking and the whole thing. So it's like, okay, there's your problem. That's why your weight loss stalled and you yeah. still have 50 more pounds to lose. I think he had lost 75 pounds at that point. And, and there's why the sugar is so high. And that's why you try glycerides are where they are. And you see, it's there. You just have to go hunting until you find it. Yeah. Oh, right. alcohol, alcohol is definitely an issue. And I, I'm not uh, unfamiliar with that myself personally. So there's, there's that, but I also want to acknowledge, you know, cause we're saying, oh, there's these sort of easy to identify thing. People are just overdoing carbs, overdoing fat, overdoing alcohol, but with, with this thyroid thing. And cause I've had so many clients like this, especially lately, they're coming to me a lot more and it tends to be women. I mean, men get stuck too, but women seem to have a, a harder time with weight loss where their metabolic rate is so slow that we've got to do something. And, and I take them at their word. They really are hunkering down. They're hardly eating anything and they still can't get weight off. And that's when we know there's a problem. You know, no, no adult woman, even if she's sedentary, nobody should have to eat, you know, 700 calories a day to lose weight. So right. that's, and I, I want to acknowledge like anyone out there who's in this position who feels like I'm fasting and I'm doing a sardine fast and I'm doing this and I still can't lose weight. Yeah. It's pro and because I, I, and I so often refer people to get blood work um, and I, I can't order it, but they can do it on their own because I, I want to, if that's the issue, I want to identify it. I don't want to encourage this person to hack their diet to death. Well, cut this out, cut that out, do this, do that, stand on your head, you know, do a tumble salt and drink MCT oil when it might not be the diet. If their metabolic rate is in the shitter, then we need some other kind of help. You know, keto right. isn't going to fix that. So um, that's, I see that a lot too, but because, because who comes to me for help? People that are really stuck. People yeah. that have maybe tried all that other stuff already and it's not getting them anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm glad that you're out there doing what you're doing. Amy, where can people find you? And uh, how can they connect with you if they want to find you? My main website is terribly out of date, unfortunately. Um, so go to stallslayer.com, like my book, stallslayer.com. Uh, there's just, just enough information there if somebody needs to contact me. And I do have a YouTube channel. So look for Amy Berger on YouTube. And um, yeah, I could, I could use some video editing help, in fact. So if anyone out there wants to barter services, feel free to drop me a line. So do not go to terriblyoutofdate.com. Please go to stallslayer.com. Find Amy there. Go check her out on YouTube. Amy, hang on until after the music stops because you have to stay on until things get to 100% over here. And we, that'll give us a second to chat. Folks, you know what to do with me. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go there, go to vinnytotteries.com. Click through the banner. If you want to find some of Amy's books, they're on Amazon. And uh, you could go there by going through vinnytotteries.com. It doesn't cost you anything. It just puts coal on the fire, gets this train down the track. And we really appreciate it. Rate and review this podcast. Unless you're one of those vegan haters that listens to the show, you guys, you know, take a knee. Don't do anything. Just sit back. We don't need you rating and reviewing with your one star. That's no fun for us. Uh, so on behalf of Amy, Amy Berger, my name is Vinny Totterich. Put life into living and let's do it with just a little bit more of the pure Prairie League. Mm -hmm.